Hey everybody, welcome back and thanks for taking the time out of your day to watch Hello Good Game. Today, we're playing traditional standard event, looking to farm cards in a best of three format. It depends what you like. Typically beginners gravitate more towards best of one. They're quick, they're fast. It's more of a, a lottery, one might say. Once you become more accustomed to the game and you're looking to crank it up, you're tired of losing because it's not your fault. We get into best of three, or even when you do lose because it's your fault, you want uh, the chance at vengeance uh, and to right that wrong, right? So best of three is uh, you know a little bit friendlier to those who are more advanced uh, with the game. They've got uh, a really good knowledge of how all of the cards within the meta work together and how to shut down specific decks within the meta quite effectively and efficiently. Sadly, this is only something you can really learn by playing best of three um, because typically the cards that are used in the sideboard don't fit well in the main board because they only have uh, a targeted use and against any of the other decks, it's a dead card. So, um, you know, you don't really see the sideboard cards in main board games in best of one. So that's why the only way to learn is by playing traditional. But that's uh, this is like another video all in its own. Today, we're talking about, uh, you know, choosing the right deck for you guys. Obviously, I do have a recommendation and we'll get into the gameplay footage. We're going to talk about tracking your win rate and your farming projections because, you know, this is a thousand gold. It's a little bit more expensive than the regular standard event, which if you're not into traditional or best of three games, we've got that covered for you. Check that video out as well. Um, it's a little bit more of an investment though, um, but the returns are a little bit higher. However, the uh, time requirements are also uh, a little bit higher, right? Instead of playing seven games, we're playing five, but they're all best of three. So potentially, you know, that's up to 15 games instead of seven. So almost twice the time requirement, almost twice the cost. However, it is almost twice uh, the reward as well. In gold, not so much in rewarded cards. Now that's kind of the downside here, right? So again, if you're not sure which one you should play, all you do is pull up your win rate tracker. And again, this is gonna be available to download for you guys for free in the description below. When you do open it up, press file and make a copy for yourself. If you don't, then we're all gonna be editing the same one. And uh, you know, in this spreadsheet, that's not really a big deal, but in some of the other ones, it can become quite confusing. So you enter your win rate, right? Uh, and to get that win rate, you might ask, how do I find my win rate with the specific deck I wanna use? Well, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, but for right now, you just would enter your win rate. We're using 55% best of three, pushes us up a little bit because we get that extra decision-making process and it's not so much based on luck. And then we go to the spe uh, specific event that we're playing. In this case, it's traditional standard event. And with that win rate, we will be netting 69 gold. We're gonna get also 0.1 of a mythic. So every 10 events we do, we're gonna at least get one mythic, which is really cool. And every event we do, we're getting 0.73 rares. Um, and that's not bad. That's like pretty good considering the event costs 1,000 and a pack which has one rare in it also costs 1,000, right? So um, you're getting a little bit less, obviously, but uh, you know, it's really, really good return uh, considering you're also earning 1069 gold back so it's really like you're getting two free uncommons almost a free rare and uh you know a, a decent chance at a mythic and you know you can kind of track how long these events will take you alongside your win rate and then you know you can kind of project out based on your available time how long it will take you to farm and you know you'll get used to once you do it one set, you'd be like, oh wow, I can actually farm 200,000 gold in a set with my win rate just playing casually on the weekends, right? Um, you'll get to know that for yourself, which is a very, very uh, handy thing to be aware of, right? Because things are expensive and it's really easy to use your resources in uh, the inefficient way. Uh, so we really wanna be kind of tight with the, the gold purse there <laughs> and uh, be converting that gold efficiently into either more games 
uh, gems, and always be upgrading uh, and going forward, never backwards. If you're interested in more of the farming procedures and numbers, we do have uh, in-depth farming guides that are readily available for you guys. Check those out. And now we mentioned, how do you actually track your win rate so you can see what your projected uh, farming will be like? Well, let's get right back into the game and we're using Magic the Gathering Arena Assistant. This is available for free on everybody with Windows in the Overwolf link in the description below. Go ahead, download that, install it. Very, very easy. And then just go into statistics. You get to see your deck uh, statistics here. All of your decks are listed. Easy peasy, uh, lemon squeezy. You just kind of pick your deck based on your win rate. Um, obviously, I entered a 55% win rate uh, within those farming uh, projections to be realistic. And you know, it's not uncommon when you do dial a specific deck in, in a specific meta to have uh, a much better win rate than that. So you know all about the event, you know what deck you're playing with your win rate, you're ready to get into it. Maybe you don't have a deck and we're gonna help you out with that today. So let's get right into it, purchasing the vent. And of course, if you do find any value within the video, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe to share the channel out to a friend, uh, of course, as well. So let's take a look at our mono white aggro deck focusing around Lurus of the Dream Den. We don't have it as a companion because we want to run four copies, which in my opinion is a little bit better than the consistent one copy because then they know when you have it and that can be a real downfall in on its own. Four copies of Alced of Life's Bounty. This is a 1-1 one, one with lifelink. We can pay one. We can sacrifice it to give another target creature or enchantment uh, protection from the color of our choice until end of turn. This is good defensively to protect us. It's also good offensively because if we have only one color or a shared color of defenders, we can obviously give protection to an attacker and then they cannot even block that creature, which is pretty, pretty cool. We've got one copy of Fight as One at instant speed. We get to choose one or both target human and then the other is target non-human both will get plus one plus one and gain indestructible until end of turn so you have to want to kind of balance a human and a non-human i don't think we have a ton of uh actually it looks like we do have a good balance now that i overview it so it shouldn't be hard to get those on both but again it's a single copy so it's not super relevant within the deck. It's basically something that you pull and just hold on to uh, to make you win the game because uh, Indestructible will not protect you from exile, but it will protect you from, you know, general destroy effects. Moving forward, uh, speaking of protecting from general destroy effects, we have the Selfless Savior, a 1-1, in which we can sacrifice at instant speed to give another target creature indestructible until end of turn. Uh, this is really neat because uh, if there's a big attack coming in, you know, we can block with the savior, we can block with another creature, then we can sack the savior and then give the other creature that blocked indestructible, thereby negating damage from both attacks and only losing our savior, uh, which is really, really cool. And of course, only if they don't have trample. And uh, much like Alcide of Life's Bounty, the Selfless Savior is really cheap. It can protect your creatures, which is really nice. And like I mentioned earlier, we are using Lurus, so it's very easily replayed later on through his ability, which we'll get to in a second if you're unfamiliar. Before we do though, we're talking about Shepherd of the Flock, a 3-1, so a pretty aggro creature, uh, also known as a blade. We can pay one for Usher to safety at instant speed as the adventure to return target permanent you control to its owner's hand. Um, Again, you know, bouncing something you own back to your hand uh, can be a very, very powerful tactic. Um, obviously, your opponent will be spending some form of removal to target that creature to make you want to bounce it, and their removal goes to the grave, whereas your creature, which was planned to go to the grave, goes back to your hand, gets replayed, and you're going to gain a little bit of, um, you know, virtual card advantage there through that. Speaking of, um, you know, a form of virtual card advantages, is the shelter and the glacier the glacier comes in tapped adding a planes to our pool obviously because it is a mono white deck we only have planes but at instant speed for two target creature you control gains protection from the color of your choice until end of turn very similar to the outset of life's bounty effect but there's no sacrifice required and it only costs one more so within the deck this is actually one of my favorite cards um you can put it on creatures to protect them from removal trying to gain, gain some form of advantage or you can even uh put on an attacker, right? So they can't defend. So that's great. 
Speaking of surviving removal, we have three, no, sorry, four copies of the Season Hallow Blade, another three one, and we can actually discard a card, tapping it to give it indestructible until end of turn. So, you know, again, from any destruction based removal, this survives. Of course, Exile still deals with it. We've got a copy of Illuminarch Aspirant. This is a 1-1, one, one, and at the beginning of combat on your turn, put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature you control. And uh, we like just to put that on our Hallow Blade, typically, or you know maybe it goes on to our Luris as well as an option. We've got the Cabra Takedown and Cabra Plateau. The Plateau comes in tapped, much like the Shelter, and the Takedown, also instant speed for two, dealing damage equal to the number of creatures we control to target creature or planeswalker. So we're going really wide with our creatures. This should be able to take anything out at instant speed for two uh, within white colors, which is actually pretty unique as far as I'm concerned. We have a single copy of Glass Casket for two, an artifact entering the battlefield, exiling a creature with converted mana cost three or less from the battlefield until it leaves the battlefield. We've got, I believe, three copies of Angelic Ascension, instant speed, exiling target creature or planeswalker, and then its controller will create a 4-4 white angel creature token with flying. Um, this is good for two reasons. A, you can exile something of yours that's been targeted with removal. The creature goes away, the removal fizzles. If it's an adventure spell, goes right to the grave, uh, right, the creature and we are gonna get a 4-4 flyer out of the deal, which is great, that's super aggro, that's exactly what we want. Or, if there's an opponent's creature, our uh, Planeswalker that's really, really bad for us, we can exile it, they get the angel, and then we can use our casket to exile the token, and then, you know, even if they do deal with the casket, the token doesn't come back because tokens can't come back from exile, and uh, easy peasy, lemon squeezy there. Speaking of exile, we have four copies of Banishing Light, our first three drop, as an enchantment, entering the battlefield, exiling target non-land permanent and opponent controls until it leaves the battlefield. So, you know, this is amazing because it takes anything. The downside here is when they remove it, they're going to get that thing back, and it's pretty easy for people to remove enchantments in 2021. Heliod Suncrowned, eh? I said it right this time, right? A 5-5 five, five with Indestructible, and when uh, Heliod's Devotion is less than 5, it's not a creature. When it is, it is. <laughs> and I ruin it. But, uh, you know, to get your Devotion to white to 5 is not a big deal. Obviously, in a mono-white deck, easy peasy. Um, and then, you know, the ability of whenever you gain life, put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature or enchantment you control is active whether it's a creature or not, which is the... The, the real benefit here of the sun crown and then you know we can also pay two to give another target creature we control lifelink until end of turn that's great as well um you know we're playing the best of both worlds we're using an aggro deck to get quick wins to increase the rate of our farming uh so we can get lots of gold within the a time allotment that we have uh while kind of you know playing the devil's advocate and knowing that other people are doing that and then incorporating life gain into the deck so it's like you know, if we both are doing it, worst case scenario, we should win because we've got life gain on the back and they probably won't. Um, you know, just uh, insider strats. We've got four copies of Maul of the Skyclave. When it enters the battlefield, goes right onto a creature we control. Equipped creature gains plus two, plus two flying and first strike. The flying is really nice. Obviously, it's a form of evasion. So getting above the defenders, they need reach. And, uh, you know, the plus two, plus two first strike should take care of that uh, pretty easily within one attack. And, uh, you know, Basri Cat for three, plus one. Put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature we control. It gains indestructible. You know, it just lets you go kamikaze if you don't need to worry about defenders. Obviously, you want to keep creatures to defend Basri so you can get to that minus ability. We do have two of them, minus two, which is the first one, is whenever one or more non-token creatures attack this turn, create that many 1-1 one, one white soldier creature tokens that are also tapped and attacking. If we're real wide, right, and they've only got a few defenders, the minus two is great because we're going to go extra wide. Minus six, though, is even better. You get an emblem with at the beginning of combat on your turn, create a 1-1 one, one white soldier creature token, then put a plus one, plus one counter on each creature you control. So, um, you know, the ability to always have a new token come in every turn, no matter what, and then everything just gets bigger every turn, no matter what, it's going to be something that is 100% impossible to keep up to removal wise. So if you can get that minus six out and survive for a few turns, you've won the game. 
four copies of Lurse of the Dream down. Now, this is what really ties the whole deck together, in my opinion. A 3-2 with lifelink, and during each of your turns, you may cast one permanent spell with converted mana cost two or less from your graveyard. We have so many ways to dodge our opponent's removal, avoid it, you know, come back from it, that Lurse of the Dream Den is just the cherry on top of this Mono White Sunday. Selfless Savior, Indestructible, Outside of Life's Bounty, Protection, um, what else do we have here? Uh, the Hollow Blade, you don't have to potentially discard a card anymore, you can just play itself from the grave. Um, you know, or the discard that does go to the grave gets replayed with Luris, which is like really, really good. And then Shepherd of the Flock as well. So the Skyclave is wanting to go on, you know, maybe a creature with lifelink if it's an aggro on aggro matchup and you need to outpush the damage race. But typically we'll put it on one of our blade creatures, the Shepherd of the Flock, Season Halloblade, to really increase our maximum amount of damage that we can get because they're pretty flimsy, only one defense, easily removed. If we can get it up to three, that's better. And now they're in the air attacking for five. Very, very good. Um, again, the Savior and Bounty really will help protect Luris and keep Luris in play as a priority, if not anything else. And, uh, you know, because they can be sacrificed to protect Luris and then Luris allows them to be replayed from the graveyard, um, this is very, very valuable. And to sum the duck up, we have the Amir's Call for 7, which the game should never go this long, but if they do create two 4-4 four, four White Angel Warriors with flying, Everything else gets indestructible until your next turn. This allows you to kamikaze attack without losing defenders. It also allows you to defend without losing attackers, right? So uh, a really good way to finish off those games if you flood out and uh, you know it goes longer than you want it to. Two Castle Arden Bales also capping for five, creating a 1-1 one, one token. Um, not great, but again, if you're flooding, it's better to dump your mana into something than just have it go on unspent 12 planes in the main deck as well so you know you can see that this list is very very light 2.3 drop uh 14 land in the deck only so because it's so light there's not a lot of land and uh, when we get into the sideboard here we've got four giant killers for one a one two we can pay two and tap it to tap another target creature this is great if they've got a really big attacker that we can't handle a hit from and uh you know we can just tap it so they can't attack us the great thing about this is because it's tapped it also won't be able to defend against us uh if they don't attack you know we can still use the tap on our end step dumping our mana into it which is great and then opening up those attack lanes speaking of opening up the attack lanes we've got chomp down for three at instant speed as the adventure just drawing target creature with power four or greater which is really the only kind of creatures that will contend us right uh, anything else we should be able to smash through with relative ease we do have two copies of sentinel's eyes giving plus one plus one and vigilance for one to one of our creatures and it has escape for one plus exiling two other cards from our graveyard you know Lurus is in deck so you don't have to worry about that so much a shadow spear if we really need more life gain uh also giving us trample and plus one plus one the key component here in my opinion is paying one to have permanence your opponent control lose hexproof and indestructible until end of turn uh that could be the key component when combining say an angelic ascension or a uh, uh takedown as well right so so we can still get the removal on big baddies that typically we wouldn't be able to we also have a disenchant for two destroying target artifact or enchantments Three copies of Divine Arrow Instant Speed for two, four damage to attacking or blocking creatures. Good old fashioned removal. Three additional caskets. We talked about the use of that earlier. And one apparition, which in my opinion could be used as a four of, but uh, it is what it is. And, uh, you know, what it is is an amazing creature. A two, two, that when it enters the battlefield, it will exile target uh, non land permanent that we don't control. That's four or less. And then when it's removed, they get an XX blue illusion uh, of the same converted mana cost, which is pretty cool. It will lose all of its abilities, which is the key component here. So that's the deck that we'll be using today to farm matches in traditional standard, playing best of three. And uh, we are trying our best to abuse the shuffler. Not a lot of land in the deck, but we can definitely make it work uh, because of all the light drops and the replayability of those drops. So. With that all out of the way, wish me luck. Make sure to like the video and subscribe for more content. 
Yesterday, in our uh, original farming deck, we went six and two, or I guess it would be six and three by the time we were done. And let's pray for a similar result today. Getting into our first match should be all right. Again, the assistant that we're using is available for free in the Overwolf link in the description below. Uh, you know, we're tracking our win rate with that to put into the spreadsheet that we're utilizing to project our farming results. And uh, yeah, then we just run it as many times as we can with our available time and, you know, even trying to keep track of that gold so we know the numbers and and you know make that conscious decision if it's worth it or not for our current status because obviously if it's taking more time then you uh make money and you can make x amount of dollars an hour doing something else always you should you know maybe do that and just buy your packs and then you're still making extra money on top of that or something right so it's going to be a different equation for everybody and the amount of time that you have to play and put into it I hate this elemental. So we can chop block and discard. We can also gain that life back. Ending our turn. And here's the removal. So, you know, the question now becomes what do we want to throw? I guess the shepherd. So now they've spent a card and uh, you know our shepherd goes to the grave but when we get to Luris we're able to replay the shepherd from the grave so uh, it is relatively high synergy. Making sure to discard things that we can play with Luris. Um, the bad thing about this is we're tapped so they get to attack. Uh, we do have the life gain, which isn't the worst though. So, meh. So they're an aggro deck. We're not gonna pay life for this. And we'll just stack some life gain in play. Whoops. Keeping the Halloblade to defend the Elemental. Oh, of course it is. That's not their fifth land, is it? No, okay, just their fourth. I was gonna say, is that a passage into a cleave? I'm gonna have an aneurysm. <laughs> Alright, not a good hit. Do we take it? We can't cast anything from our grave. I think we just take it. We gain two back. It's really like we only take three, hopefully. Mmm. That's very good against us. That's might actually warrant an Angelic Ascension. It's too bad they're so aggro. So this literally doesn't matter. Um, I'm gonna have it fizzle though. Right, so if we get rid of the target, then uh, Bone Crusher Giant doesn't have anything to hit, it goes straight to the grave. At least we did that.
Ras teachings still guide me. My sand will protect you. Just attacking with Alsad. Okay, it's got indestructible. Let's gain the life. We can defend with the blade. Kind of. I don't know how to deal with this ooze. We need to take down before it gets too big. We need that casket. The light even. It's going to be a bit to get to. We're just uh, doing some content for YouTube, farming videos in traditional today. We're going to lose Basri. There's multiple creatures to get rid of here. They've got the mana. God damn it. <laughs> But the damage was still going to Basri. Attack one. <sighs> Deep press. It's only the first match of the first game. Frickin' gruel. I wish this was a fight, not a shelter. We could get protection from green. This is going to make them go crazy. But I think that's fine. They'll spend their mana on their ooze, that means. Hey, at least it wasn't a passage. <sighs> Getting hit for... Gosh, must be like 13 or something by the time we're done. We got two more to take, so it takes it to five. They got one to take, six. 16 damage. Oh! is still a match somehow we do gain five of it back It would be cool if we did have the blade as a defender um, because they wouldn't have been out of mana and we could have actually got that in play next turn. That's okay though. We should have played the shelter and we could have double angeled these guys, I think. I'm going to toss this shelter and it's going to screw us.
Hopefully it's not a land, right? Hopefully it's not a land, and hopefully they put the cleave on the ooze. Then they don't attack with the elemental, and we get rid of the ooze. Bad thing about the ascension, if we do end up using it on the blade, which it looks like we might have to if we're going to try to kill this guy. He's a good defender, right? That's a good defender. And that makes it so they can't re-equip it. Not that that matters because this is an instant speed. Then they get a 4-4 flyer. What are we going to do about that? Let's see how lucky we can get with this top deck. Oh! <laughs> we just do it to them again. Pass our turn. Oof, this is getting weird. Innkeeper's so good. Now they get a draw with the giant. Ah! You see how close we're getting though? And they're not equipping cleave now. They're gonna try to cleave this beast because we first striked that hollow blade so that it wouldn't work. We still hold an ascension. And if playing this glacier screws us, I'm gonna cry. Interesting. We have four mana up. I think we just won the game. Casket on the angel. We hit for five. And we hold up an ascension. Oh, but that makes another angel. Ah! Damn it! What if we double block it? It hits for 12, we can stop 4. We could Angel Alsad and block 6 of it and only take 6 and hit for 5. Goodness gracious! Oh fuck, but they go all in. But that allows us to gain more life for free. I think. We'll see what happens here. Oh no, we've got a... So here we're taking... 2, 8... 9, 10... And we gain three back. Right? There's 12 damage here. We're blocking four, which is eight, nine, ten. And then we drop it by three. We should have one life left.
Do they have a shock or something? That would be sad. Come on, baby. Let us have it. Woo! Hot dog! <laughs> <laughs> mm -mm -mm. so we just have to do that 15 more times it's gonna be a nice short video for you guys today we'll probably break it up into parts um goodness gracious Oof. i think that giant killer is gonna be pretty nice and i want to nuke their henge if they play it. Is that instant speed? Disenchant? It is. So we've got 66 in hand, a minute 30 to deal with it. Shepard's great. The giant killer is so good. We screwed them so hard with that angel, but it was really hard to make work. Uh, a minute left. I'm worried about the time here. The exile stays. The takedown stays. The shelter stays. Um, I think Basri can go. Eloy should stay. Uh, two cards left, 45 seconds. Just keep always in mind the time so you don't time out. Because if you don't confirm, it won't save anything. Um, 38. The Skyclave's nice. Fight as one can go. And let's drop one Ascension, even though it won us the game. But they're going to be coming for it because they're like, screw that card, right? So it's not bad to shift, um, you know, to a parallel thought line. Not quite the same, but still very relevant. Let's take a look at the chance to straw land. It's very low because we're trying to abuse the shuffler. And we won the first game, so I think we should risk it because we've got one drops in hand. We'll pick up a land, and if it's a slow land, we'll play slow. Oh, perfect. Let's uh, toss the savior in the sky. Can we toss this, like, uh, sack it if there's no targets for it? Like, if they stomped it here, could we sack it into Oblivion? I don't think so. Yeah, so that's why we played the Savior over the Alistair of Life's Bounty. Because, um, you know. We didn't want to lose our life gain. We might have to giant kill her, the giant. <laughs> Um, before they get an ooze in play, we need to get Lurus ripping. But I don't want it to get stomped on, you know what I mean? Fuck! <laughs> you son of a bitch. And we just played our takedown. Why, I oughta? So we're gonna giant killer it. Or, on their, oh no, they, their land on taps, shit. I think it's still better that way. Oh, sorry. No attacks. Let's end our turn. We can giant killer the token we make out of the ooze.
Let's try to get them to not ooze. Right, if they play something else, that's good. Wow, the stupid giants there too, like... That pushes them to the Great Henge, and now that's upsetting to me. But we have removal for the Henge in hand, so... I think we're still okay. Oh, uh, we shouldn't have passed priority, but they could have done it in response. I hate you scavenging ooze. <sighs> it's a little bit frustrating. If it attacks with the ooze, I'm going to chump block it with a 4-4 flyer. You fool. We have to make something work, right? We're going to get pummeled if we don't. So it's like trying to find value in any engagement uh, that you can. Playing lots of land for only having 12 in deck, right? <laughs> This needs to be done at instant speed. Let's end our turn. There could be a hench here. And uh, that's going to be shitty. <laughs> <laughs> the Great Hedge is such a good card. A Mammoth. That's actually okay. That's not the worst. Land, whatever. Let's snag the Beast. Alcid comes in play for one. Lurus in for three. We can protect Lurus now with Alcid and just pummel in turn by turn with this 4 4 flyer. Just trying to put them on as quick as a timer as we can. Holding the giant killer in hand for now. We'll play it next turn. We'll have plenty of mana to make that work. Oof. This thing could hit us hard, though. We're gonna give it protection, why not grab the life from it? There's nothing for us to take. So we may as well try to risk the play. They need direct damage at instant speed in hand to make it work. It hits, it looks like, and protection from green. And that way we still gain the life. Um, protection from green is not protection from red, though, is the problem. Ugh! The problem. We should have waited. We're being so greedy. Hmm, they take the flyer instead. That's interesting. <sighs> it's not quite a hench to take, but I'll still do it. And um that's gonna be win number two. So, uh, you know, you can see a very, very cool deck uh to get out and start farming with. And, um, you know, I'm not sure we'll be able to do all of these five matches within one video. We're already at 45 minutes, right? So, you know, we'll probably call it quits there, you guys. Um, you know, I have 100% faith in this deck. 
uh, do stay tuned. We'll have a part two for you guys where we play the rest of it. If you are really looking forward to it, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, share the channel out to a friend. And, uh, you know, of course, if you do have any comments about the deck, leave them below. You can download the assistance that we're using to track our win rate in the Overwolf link in the description below. And of course, we do have the farming projections, which you then input your win rate into to get the numbers to kind of see really what you're doing with your time. Again, thank you for your time and attention. We'll see you again soon in the next video.